Greetings again from the uh, forests of Northern California. Welcome to another episode of Crime Pays But Botany Doesn't. Today, I'm again on uh, the favorite, my favorite geologic substrate known as serpentine, okay? The ultramafic rocks, aka the ultramafics, all right? Now, you rarely get ultramafic rocks in uh, most of North America, okay? Quite rare in more, most of North America, but in California, they're quite common. You get two different forms. You get the nice serpentine like this. It's kind of green and a uh, luminous uh, color to it right there you can see you got the some nice uh, striations there uh, which indicates it's a uh, metamorphic origins or you get this uh, this kind of you know um, oxidized uh, red more weathered substrate of the ultramafic rocks but either way when you see ultramafics they're going to be a lot more barren than the surrounding uh the surrounding areas where there is where there, there, there is no ultramafic uh, exposure. So you can see where the ultramafic rocks start over there, the forest stops. Now, of course, you've probably heard me rant about this many times before. Ultramafic rocks are indicative of the uh, former presence of a subduction zone. That's how they originally got slapped onto the continent. Most of this rock uh, you would not get on the, uh, on a, the Earth's surface. It's uh, mostly a, a, a deeper crustal rock. Okay. Now, serpentine is just a, a basically a cooked form of peridotite. And again, peridotite, you mostly get uh, deep within the Earth's crust. Okay. So you metamorphous peridotite is serpentinite, the California state rock, this stuff right here. And there's actually a whole suite of different minerals that compose this rock. Serpentine is just kind of a broad term that uh, we use to refer to it. Okay. There's a whole host of different uh, minerals that give it that the uh, that kind of lime green, jade green texture. And bringing up the word jade, sometimes you will find jade in serpentine. Sometimes you also find asbestos. It all depends on uh, what was going on when that rock was formed. What what was the pressure? What was the temperature? What what minerals uh, were present when that rock was being formed, uh, etc. So uh, anyway, let's get a move on. I'll show you some of the cool plants we got because if you heard me rant about it before. You will know that serpentine basically induces speciation in plants over, you know, massive amounts of time. So you know, a lot of plants have trouble growing on this stuff because it's low in calcium, it's low in nitrogen, it's got excess amounts of magnesium and iron and nickel and other uh, elements that are toxic to plants in high amounts. But uh, so a lot of plants have trouble growing on it. But of course, evolution being what it is, many plants eventually evolved to tolerate it. And uh, maybe not thrive, but certainly eke out a living and, and become a new species uh, out of uh, whatever the sister species were that grew off of serpentine. So anyway, it's a little bit uh, oversimplified of a version for it. But let's fucking get a move on. You'll get the you'll get the gist of it eventually. Okay, now ironically, the first plant I'm going to show you today has nothing to do with serpentine. Okay, it's not a serpentine endemic plant. We are not currently on serpentine right now. We're actually on, I believe, uh, Ordovician marine sediments, uh, as well as just, you know, hundreds of uh, thousands of years of, uh, uh, you know, biological material accumulating uh, as a result of uh, the plants right here. Uh, you got the topsoil and then the rock beneath. But I do want to show you this plant because it's pretty interesting and I got a little bit to uh, spit about it. This is a, a plant uh, known, colloquially known as Oregon grape. It's in the family Berberidaceae. It used to be in a genus Mahonia. It was Mahonia aquifolium. I believe they, they merged Mahonia into the genus Berberis now. But either way, uh, you know, I, I may, uh, may kind of take a couple jabs at herbalism every now and then, but this is actually a plant that I will use if I'm sick, but I only use it if I'm sick, okay? I'm not just going out to compulsively shop in nature, rip it out the ground, make potions and tinctures out of it, etc. because I'm desperate uh, to uh, to uh, relate the plants somehow, okay? But anyway, that, that all aside, if you, if you were to take this plant up, and I'm not going to do it now again because I'm not sick and I don't need it, but if you were to take this uh, this plant up, rip it up out of the ground, you'd see that the root is a bright yellow color. You scrape away some of the, the root the root bark, and you'd see that the uh, root is a bright yellow color, and that's because this plant contains a compound called berberine. Now, berberine has been shown, or berberine, however the fuck you pronounce it, has been shown uh, to uh, produce antimicrobial and possibly anti-inflammatory effects. There's a number of research papers out there on this. So, remember, plants are chemical factories. They're producing... Uh, you know, multitudes of chemicals uh, to uh, also known as secondary metabolites 
to uh, protect themselves against fungal and insect attack, help them survive in their environments, etc. And some of those compounds are beneficial to humans, okay? I mean, sometimes I believe like 80% of the, the drugs used by the pharmaceutical industry are based on compounds uh, first discovered in plants, okay? Or they're variations of compounds that have been synthesized uh, from compounds that plants produce, okay? That aside, you know, there, there's a whole fad of just, uh, you know, basically making potions and tinctures out of this. And sadly enough, it's often done by people who aren't sick and don't need it, okay? I.e. Etsy witches, the white girls in their 20s, etc. Now, I take jabs at them, uh, but, you know, overall, I don't want to shit on anybody. I'm excited that they're excited about plants, okay? I'm excited they're into this stuff, okay? But I think uh, there's, I think they're just a little bit clueless that, about the fact that there's more than one specific way to relate to plants, okay? You don't need to go compulsive shopping in nature and just rip a bunch of stuff out of the ground and make potions out of it that uh, that you then ingest is a way of relating to plants you could also just learn about them learn about their ecology etc and i think the reason that a lot of people forget this fact is because uh, such information is uh, largely unavailable to people okay or they don't know where to look for it okay and that's because you know most of the most of the ways you learn about this stuff uh traditionally has been through college okay but now we got the internet we got wikipedia we got the uh, google scholar etc so what i encourage people to do and uh, you know, i get it the world is bleak uh the hu human society is fucking bleak there's the fruits of this uh, oregon grape right there that's why that's why it's got the colloquial name Oregon grape. Human society is bleak. The world can be depressing, etc. You want a way to relate to the world outside of yourself. The world as it's related, it's, as it's existed for uh, hundreds of millions of years. But uh, and so, being from a consumer society, the first way you know how to do that is to just take it, man. Take it for yourself. Make potions out of it. Bunch of woo-woo medicines, whatever. And uh, you know, maybe you'll appropriate indigenous culture as an excuse for why you're. Uh, engaging in this behavior anyway but uh and i'm not necessarily knocking it you want to grow this stuff yourself that's fine you got a plant like this which is obviously abundant here you want to take a little bit no big deal my beef with it comes when you know you're taking rare plants like golden seal or osha or monotropa uniflora you know aka the ghost pipe which is actually mildly toxic and has no proven benefits whatsoever and, uh, you know, you just basically, you're just doing a fad, you know, and you're going compulsive shopping in nature and it gets pretty ridiculous. You're playing Etsy, which whatever. So what I encourage them to do is look a little bit deeper. Okay. Uh, learn about plants, learn about their ecology, their evolution, go spend time around them. Okay. Go outside. Okay. Go spend time around them. Resist the urge to pluck things out of the ground and just, uh, you know, study them, uh, learn about why the, their morphology exists the way oh nice garrier right there nice silk tassel gary aca okay go learn about why they they are the way they are what uh, animals and insects they they interact with what fungi and microbes in the ground they interact with okay how they evolve what they're related to how they're adapted to their environment why does a plant that grow in a desert grow in the desert how is it adapted to grow in a desert why does a plant that grows in a swamp grow in a swamp you know, just think about the bigger picture instead of just yourself. So, you know, again, I'm not trying to shit on anybody, but uh, for Christ's sakes, you know, I just, uh, at what point does it really just amount to uh, to shopping in nature, you know? Shopping is therapy, which we know people do. Let's be honest, okay? You know, there's some, you know, there's some people out there that do that. There's quite a few of them, all right? It's a fucking bleak outlook on the world. It's a little bit the pauper. Let's expand our perspective beyond our ourselves. Anyway, rant over. Here we go. Okay, anyways, just speaking of the Etsy witches, here's a plant that's a relative of another plant that the Etsy witches love. This is Pterospora andromeda, and it's in the subfamily Monotropoidae of the blueberry family Ericaceae. And this plant, like the ghost pipe, which the Etsy witches love, Monotropa uniflora, uh, parasitizes mycorrhizal fungi in the ground. You can see it's a chlorophyllous. It doesn't produce any of its own chlorophyll, and it does not engage in uh, any of its own photosynthesis. It's just stealing uh, water and nutrients uh, from uh, fungi in the ground. Now, Monotropa uniflora, the ghost pipe, we don't get much of in California. You get a lot of it on the East Coast, upstate New York. You get a little bit in Oregon and uh, 
the Pacific Northwest. And again, Etsy witches love it. They say things like it's a nervine, it's a nervous system ally, it calms anxiety, it uh, it re- it reduces pain, it mitigates uh, the nervous system's uh, uh, effects, etc. Blah blah blah. You know, basically just nonsense. They're basically just inventing placebo. Uh, effects. You're basically just inventing placebo effects so that they can have a remedy for a problem which may or may not exist. So, and again, that's another rare uh, plant. Okay, this is not that rare, Pterospora andromeda. But though, I don't know what happens to you if you ingest it or put it in your ass or make a tincture out of it. Monotropo uniflora can be rare in areas of North America, so that makes it more infuriating when you get these uh, these fruitcakes ripping it out of the ground to make potions and tinctures. And again, you know, most of them happen to be people in their 20s and 30s who aren't sick to begin with. You know, but you tell somebody that if you put this in your ass, it's going to feel good and calm you down and make the world less depressing and, uh, you know, give you less anxiety, they're going to take it and uh, they're going to end up uh, reducing populations of it. More more wonderful human-caused impact on ecosystems, Okay. If you could grow this yourself, it'd be a different story, but uh, anyway, I don't know. Anyway, there you go. Pterospora andromeda. Monotropoidea is a wonderful subfamily of the blueberry family or a KCA. Everything in that family. Sarcodes, uh, mono, monotropa, pterospora, hematomies, all those plants, uh, there's, and there's quite a number of genera in that subfamily, are all mycoheterotrophic. They all parasitize fungi in the ground, and they don't produce any chlorophyll. And I got a nice set. I got a nice figure to him. Now you're looking good. You've been working out, huh? Real nice, uh, real nice morphology on these these fucking plants. So there's there's the flowers. Just to just you know, no leaves, just a flower stalk with no uh, chlorophyll in it. It's the nice, uh, nice raceme. Look at those goddamn super glandular too. Look at all the glands. You see the glands, huh? Brick. Okay, here we go. One of our first uh, serpentine. Uh, endemic plants. So you rarely ever see this guy growing off the serpentine, and you rarely ever see this guy anywhere else but the mountains of Northern California and Southern Oregon. This is Balsamoriza lanata, the woolly balsam root. See how woolly it is? Isn't it woolly? Huh? It's real fucking woolly. See all the trichomes on there? Okay, a lot of wonderful members of the uh, sunflower family, Asteraceae dudas. Again, that's a way to mitigate the uh, uh, leaf temperatures getting too hot from exposure to that ultraviolet light. And being a plant that's commonly found in the serpentine habitat, which is pretty barren, and it, it you know often uh, is pretty high exposure to sun, you're going to need that wool as well as that blue color on there. There's the flower head right there. That nice sudantium, that nice capitulum. See a bunch of little tiny flowers. Oh, looks like the bugs got this. We're a little bit late in a game here for these flowers. A lot of them have already gone off already. There's the phyleries, okay? Now, balsam root, is, uh, as you'll know, if you live in uh, the west, the mountainous west or the northwest, uh, is, a, you know, typically you got this rosette of basal leaves, and then it sends up a flower. Not to be confused with a similar genus, Wyethia, which normally has colline leaves. It'll send up a flower, the Wyethias, the mule's ears, but then it's got, you know, leaves on, a, on a, the uh, shoot that it sends up as well. Balsam root will never do that. And again, you get that big-ass root down there, Maybe not in this species, but certainly in a, uh, the other species of balsam root. Uh, especially, I mean, you'll see the leaves on some of these fucking balsam root plants. They're enormous. You know, almost a foot, a foot in length. You know, almost a foot in width sometimes. So, anyway, there you go. Balsamorize the lanata. Yeah, I love how dissected these leaves are. Look at it. Not entire, okay? Just uh, heavily dissected with those, uh, with the wool. And then a different, uh, you got, you know, what, five or six lobes per these little leaflets that are made. And then here's the flower head. Here's the flower head. You can see it's just finishing up, okay? And then here's one that's well past two. You can see those individual seeds, those akines maturing in there. The little green margin around each one, that's the pele, which uh, is basically like a little envelope that uh, some species of the sunflower family Asteraceae get that surrounds the seed, okay? There's a, there's a genus uh, down in Mexico uh, called, uh, what was the fucking name, Montanoa, that gets, the Pele are fucking huge, and it forms, once the whole flower head's done, the Pele swell, and they become uh, basically wind dispersal mechanisms, so that the whole flower head breaks off from uh, the branch, and then, you know, gets uh, blown around the, the cloud forest habitat where it grows. Oh, look at this lovely serpentine right here. 
It's, it's uh, like a white color. Again, just another variation on a theme right there, on a theme of uh, serpentinite and the uh, metamorphous stultromaphic rocks. Now, uh, Caryophyllaceae, the namesake family of the order Caryophyllales, the order of cacti, beets, quinoa, spinach, ice plant, all that shit. Uh, Caryophyllaceae is a very interesting family, and it uh, does very well. It's very common in uh, the mountains of uh, Western North America, and here's a member of it. This is in the genus Minuartia. Okay, you can see those uh, five uh, distinct, not united petals, and those uh, somewhat uh, pronounced stamens. Those little looking like little bug antennas. Okay, and of course it's it's very glandular. Okay, just covered in the fuzz and the glands. Okay, the trichomes, the fuzzy fuzz, and the glands. There's the, what do the sepals look like there? There you go. Hey, how about that? Caryophyllaceae. You see something with tiny flowers less than a diameter of a, of a penny, okay, in a mountainous region, and it's forming a little mat, okay, whether you're in South America or, uh, or North America, and especially if you're higher up. And uh, it's got, it looks, it get this general morphology with the five petals and, uh, you know, form, forming this little mat thing. It's, it's good chance it could be in uh, Caryophyllaceae. Okay, nice. Now, growing here in a little seep, in a little divot, in a mountain, okay, where it sounds like uh, someone's grandpa's taking a leak, we got quite a few interesting plants right here. Okay, look at this. We got a species of columbine, okay, Aquilegia. Oh, look at that. Look at that. With the spurs on the sepals, okay, the petals have been turned into little hoods, little, little nectaries, and then there you go. You got all those... Uh, all those stamens, okay? Ranunculaceae is the family, the buttercup family, okay? And the number of stamens there should be a good indication, of course, uh, of ranunculaceae. It tends to be a trademark. They got tons of stamens in that family. Over here, you got a member of the uh, Asparagaceae monocot family, wonderful monocot family. This is Hastingsia. Hastingsia alba, okay? Probably named after some prick named Hastings, okay? Kind of tragic. Plants shouldn't be named after people, but uh, what are you going to do? There's those individual flowers. This one's still going off. Most have finished up. Look at those brown anthers. Six brown anthers. White corolla, white petals. And a, uh, you know, two or three foot, foot, two or three foot uh, tall spike right there. There's the leaves of that uh, aquilegia. And over here, we got a favorite. In Northern California and the Pacific Northwest in general, Lilium partilinum. Little speckled perianth right there. And again, being a monocot, of course, it's got the six stamens right there with the relatively prominent anthers on them. Relatively large anthers. And right there in the center, you get that stigma. Style and stigma. Together uh, forming a pistol. A pistol. That leads to a, a three a carpeled uh, ovary. Ah, oh, nice. We got a rare plant over here. Okay, here's Aspidotus densa. This is not the rare plant I was talking about, but it's a good indicator of the serpentine uh, lifestyle. Okay, the serpentine stees, serpentine stilo, okay, serpentine bondage dungeon, which we're all imprisoned in right now. There you go, Aspidotus densa. It's a xeric fern member of the Pteridaceae, and it's commonly encountered on serpentine, which this certainly is. Look at that goddamn rock. Look at that color right there. Beautiful color right there. Okay, and you got the Jeffrey Pines just thriving. Okay, Jeffrey Pines doing her thing. Okay, another three needled pine right there. But this plant I want to show you don't look like much at first, but again, when you put it in context, you know, because it becomes a little bit more interesting. Okay, and there's a member of the kale family, Brassicaceae. Many of them are notorious for tolerating shit soil conditions. This is Thelopodium brachycarpum right there. Okay, so Thelopodium brachycarpum is a, it's a rare plant. It's only known from a handful of locations. It's got somewhat of a restricted range, and it's because it's a serpentine endemic. And I mean, not endemic. It, it tolerates uh, alkaline soil, too, which a lot of ultramafic rock is, okay? But uh, just, you know, mostly can only be found. Uh, I think you get a, a small, there's a couple small populations in the northern Sierra Nevada, maybe the central Sierra Nevada, and then 
uh, some other populations, maybe in a Great Basin, and then you get it there. Pretty, pretty, uh, pretty small populations here in Northern California as well. You can see the basal leaves uh, heavily dissected. The the mid colline leaves, which you call the mid colline, are just colline normally refers to the stem, and uh, you know just halfway up the stem. Mid colline leaves, they're simple, simple and entire. Okay, but they're sessile. There's no petiole right there. Actually, they're, they're more yeah, they're sessile and clasping. So there's no there's no leaf stem. There's no petiole. And they got that nice blue color too. Okay, okay, maybe a little bit of psych ward green in there too, depending on your mood. And then there's that inflorescence, and uh, you can see flowers up top are uh, full frontal. They're at the full anthesis doing their thing. And uh, the flowers at the bottom are done, and they have, uh, they're have maturing into fruits right there. Which again, in a brassica family, are known as siliques, or uh, sometimes silicles, which is a slight variation on a silique. But yeah, you can see the, the base leaves are done. But yeah, just growing on pure serpentine. Along with that uh, grass, whatever the shit that is, but I don't pay attention to most, most grasses. So, But I guarantee you that grass is a native, and it's probably a serpentine endemic too. Do you like the serpentine lifestyle? You prick. Huh? I hope so. There's Thelopodium brachycarpum. Hey, there is nobody out here right now. I could be wearing a sequined golden thong and a motorcycle hat, and uh, nobody would see me. You know, I'd be getting all dressed up with nowhere to go. In fact, how you know I'm not wearing that right now? Very well could be. Just total desolation. Just out here screaming at the top of my lungs to know in particular. Look at this bee. The bees love the thelopodium. How about that? Is that a xylocopa species? What's she doing over there? What you doing over there? Huh? Nice areogonum up there on that, uh, that rack. So no matter where you are, if you got ultramafic racks and ultramafic geology exposed at the surface, you're going to get a whole host of uh, plant species that have, that eventually evolve to tolerate that ultramafic geology. It doesn't matter if you're, uh, you know, in an ultramafic area in a desert, and I've seen that, or an ultramafic area in a tropical environment, like, say, Cuba or New Caledonia, and I've seen that, or if you're in uh, what's beginning to be the mountainous Pacific Northwest, which is where we are here, you're going to get the same effect on plants. You're going to get plant species to evolve that look uh, entirely different from their sister species that grow off of the ultramafic uh, substrate right here. You can see you got, got the nice serpentine everywhere. Now this plant, you can see this tree right here is a pine. The rest of the forest is mostly tapered off, okay? Unlike uh, over there, you can see where there's not as much ultramafic, you get a little bit thicker of a forest, but here there's not as much forest anymore. Just this one species of pine tree, and it would be this guy, the Jeffrey pine, okay? And like the ponderosa pine, it's got needles that occur in fascicles of three, in a bunch of three. Okay, three needles to a bunch. If you don't got a cone, it's a you know, key diagnostic factor for figuring out, for helping to figure out what species of pine you're looking at. Okay, does it have two needles to a bunch, five needles to a bunch, three needles to a bunch, one needle per fascicle, or what? But, uh, but here you got a cone. You can see this differs from ponderosa pine in that the, those... Uh, spines on each one of those scales those spiny projections point inward so they you know the common saying is jeffrey pines are friendly whereas ponderosa are not you know you grasp a ponderosa cone like that you're going to be poking the shit out of your hand so anyway let's take a look at this plant that's growing at the base of this ponderosa pine because it is another serpentine endemic and it's a very interesting one at that oh <laughs> yeah this is nice this is one of my favorites right here you got a nice penstemon yeah. Anyway, this is Connectus suffrutescens. And as you can tell, it's a member of the Asteraceae, the sunflower family. But this is a uh, species that pretty much only grows on serpentine, okay, on a serpentine uh, substrate, okay, and it's endemic to Northern California. Okay, maybe a little bit in Southern Oregon, but uh, this is mostly endemic to Northern California. Look at those uh, flower heads, nice, get up close. You can see those individual florets, those individual five-lobed corollas. No daisy rays, no ligules, just a discoid flower with those little Y-shaped styles pointing out. If they're in a Y-shape, remember they're in a female phase. 
if they're just looking like a little rod like on this guy, they're in a male phase. Doing that whole secondary pollen presentation thing that Aster ACA does. Okay, you can see the, the goddamn stems are quite uh, quite glab, glandular and sticky right there. Oh, yeah. There's the phyleries. One series. One series. Oh, maybe you got two series of phyleries. And then there's that foliage. That beautiful goddamn foliage, okay? Blue and covered in glands and trichomes because, again, this plant grows on serpentine just like that thelopodium. And a serpentine, because of its uh, harsh soil chemistry, tends to mean, tends to be synonymous with more sun exposure, more open exposures to ultraviolet light, etc. Here's a canactus of frutescence in a uh, basically all done flower and producing seed. I wonder how easy this would be to grow. A lot of these serpentine plants don't need serpentine, they're just tolerant of it. So you can actually grow uh, quite a few, you know, uh, quite a few serpentine endemic plants they grow just fine off serpentine they just tend to like the serpentine or so the theory goes because that's where they can out compete uh, other plants they're just adapted to it see look at that those little uh papery things that's the uh, pappus okay so in a dandelion the pappus is those uh that hairy fuzz that helps it get blown around in the wind and connect the suffrutescence the pappus is uh those little papery scales that again aid in wind dispersal suffrutescent just means yeah, basically like a like a, a semi shrub you know woody basally and uh herbaceous epically so this it's a perennial it's a dieback but some can get quite big this is a tiny one it can get upwards you know foot foot and a half two feet tall and it's just a, a ton of them on this serpentine but you go off the serpentine you're not going to find a connectus look at the uh, individual flowers of this thelopodium those four white uh, petals got brassicas are so weird see it took me a while to appreciate them you know because i just always always just thought of kale but uh there's, there's some fucking remarkable plants i mean it can really <laughs> It just the, you find brassicas just tolerating all kinds of just horrendous conditions, shitty soil, you know, intense intense heat. There's a lot of desert brassicas. Okay, newfound respect for this family. Okay, especially the rare serpentina endemic ones. Okay, so as you can see how green this is, there's obviously a seep right here. This is just off the side of the road. You got a couple of lilies up there. That Lilium partilinum, you got that Hastingsia, that memory of Asparagaceae again. And uh, right down here, you got a species of orchid in the genus uh, Platanthera. You can see it's got that spur that's uh, projecting downwards towards the stem from that, uh, that white corolla. It doesn't look like these have quite opened yet. These uh, flowers have quite opened yet. There's some more up there. Maybe I'll show you later. But obviously, let's talk about the pink elephant in the room. This magnificent bastard right in front of me. It's a California pitcher plant, another endemic known only from Southern Oregon and Northern California. And it's in the family Saraceniaceae. And uh, it's the only member of that family. Same uh, family as Saracenia, the pitcher plants you get in uh, Florida, North Carolina, Georgia, uh, South Carolina bogs and what the shit. Even get a couple of those Saracenias in Minnesota and Illinois, always growing in bogs, uh, as well as uh, the genus Heliamphora, which you get in South America, and which is a really weird looking uh, fucking plant. They're all in the family Saraceniaceae, but this is the only member that grows on the West Coast. Now, important thing to note here is, of course, this uh, carnivory, those pictures are for carnivory, of course. They, they uh, basically use the nitrogen uh, that's produced by decaying insect bodies as a way to uh, basically compensate for the lack of nitrogen in the soil right here. And remember, we are, uh, we are on that serpentine substrate, so the soil here does tend to be very nutrient-poor. Now, these are not serpentine endemics. You frequently see them on serpentine, but you'll also just see them in boggy areas as well. Uh, I believe the southern extent of their range is in Nevada County, California, and the northern extent is uh, somewhere in southern Oregon. But uh, to get to the point right here, this is a pretty incredible plant, okay? It's uh, estimated that it diverged uh, from the rest of the family, that is the genera uh, Saracenia and Heliamphora, 
in the Oligocene sometime, roughly 30 million years ago, okay? So uh, the two species split evolutionarily, or their ancestor, they split off from their, their shared ancestor 30 million years ago, and uh, what, you, what you got today is this weird bastard growing in the boggy serpentine seeps and wetlands of Northern California. Now how this differs from the genus Saracenia is that Saracenia you'll see growing uh, you know, in North Carolina, Florida, etc., like I said, but that that uh, genus Saracenia, and however many uh, species there are in it, at least a dozen, uh, probably I think like I think there's actually like I think there's actually like twenty species of Saracenia. Is those are always growing in warm, stagnant bogs and swampy areas where the water is warm and filled with tannic acid, etc. This guy right here only grows in areas with cool, flowing water. Okay, he's not he does not tolerate any of that. Uh, super warm uh just stagnant water like uh like his cousin uh, saracenia does and i believe you know for some of those carnivorous plant fanatics uh that's the problem that they encounter growing this guy is he does need cool if not cold uh water and uh and this this water certainly is because again it's a seep it's running this is not just the bugs see we're on a hillside and then you cross the road it continues there's more bag baggy bag over there but the, you can see, if you look at the top of this guy's, that little uh, hood, which is, the whole picture structure is just a modified leaf. You look at the top of that hood, you can see those translucent cells right there, a.k.a. the fenestrations. And those, uh, the purpose those serve, they're just basically, you know, cells that stop producing chlorophyll and just become translucent. And, of course, that helps trap that insect in there. Okay, so the insects are attracted to... Uh, to this picture, just like uh, in, a, in a family Saracenia, or in a genus Saracenia and a genus Heliamphora, there's a nectar producing organ. If you could see it, that little inrolled, that, see with that red margin right there? That produces nectar. So that's what gets the bastards in there. And then, of course, they end up crawling down in there. And uh, they, they to, to get out, they're duped into thinking that they're, they're flying towards the light. Go towards the light! Go towards the light, Johnny! By flying towards those... Uh, those fenestrations, those window cells, and they just keep doing it and doing it, and of course they never get out because this hood is recurved. To get out, they'd have to be some witty bastards and drop out that uh, that little hole. And of course, being at that uh, margin of that that entrance is inrolled too, it makes it extra hard. So, uh, but again, they're attracted by that nectar, and this is this is the interesting part right here. You can see you got these little fishtail appendages right there. Now, for a long time, it was thought that the these fishtail appendages served some purpose in getting the, the insects to go in there, getting the bugs to go in there. However, there was a study done, I believe it was four or five years ago, where some uh, some wise ass decided, okay, let's test that theory. And so they went to one of these populations and they cut all those fishtail fish tails off. They had a control group where they didn't cut none off. Then they had their experimental group where they cut all those fishtail projections off. And uh, believe it or not, removing that fishtail appendage it had no effect whatsoever on the amount of insects that they later recovered from the bottom of that uh, tube right there. So it's it appears to not to be an adaptive uh, trait to help uh, bugs get in there. And of course, why would you need that? Because you got those nectaries right there. You got the nectar secreting organ right there on the, on the margins. Now the interesting thing about that nectar secreting origin uh, organ too is that only like one or two percent of the bugs that visit this will get stuck in there. Okay, and that makes sense, because if you're trapping every bug that's coming to get nectar from that organ, they're going to catch on real quick, okay? So you got to let a couple of them have it, okay, without them getting trapped, and then, of course, that 1% or 2% are going to end up as uh, your source of nitrogen in the base of that. Very crafty, very witty, and cunning. Just kidding, it's evolution. It doesn't work like that. You can't think like that. So uh, you got the fishtail appendage right there, and you got the uh, nectary right there, if I can, this poor bastard, I'm twisting his ass up, that nectary right there, and that inrolled, uh, the, the inner, inrolled inside of that hood. So, Darlingtonia californica, there you go, really cool plant, really fucking weird, known as the cobra lilies, again, not related to lilies at all, there's the flowering structure, there's the flowers right there, here's what the fruit looks like, once the flowers are mature and have been pollinated, you can see it's a little capsule, with those uh, bulbous sides to it. Now let's get to the point over here. If this fishtail structure isn't helping insects get up in that uh, 
that column and that picture, then what's the point of it? Well, there's a couple different hypotheses, okay? One is that it's just a vestigial structure evolutionarily left over, in quotes, and, uh, you know, isn't, uh, isn't necessary anymore, doesn't really serve a purpose anymore, but evolution, uh, just there was no reason, there was no selective pressure to uh, basically get rid of it, then it's like, you know, kind of like if you say you had like a tow hitch on your truck, because you used to have a bunch of redneck toys and shit, you know, sand buggies, jet skis, other stupid shit, but, uh, you know, your wife made you get rid of all that shit because you never used it, as she should have, and it was just a giant waste of money, then you don't need the trailer for your truck anymore, but you still got that tow hitch. Kind of like that, okay? Another hypothesis is that it's just, uh, you know, facultatively photosynthetic, so it's basically just, you know, basically more surface area to collect that light, okay, produce, uh, you know, photosynthesize more, produce more of them carbs and uh, what the shit, and basically aid in a produ production of this entire hood. Uh, and then there's, of course, the third hypothesis that it somehow does aid in nectar production for that nectary that, again, I'm going to do it to this poor bastard again, for that nectary, that, that nectar producing organ that it was at the, at, at the uh, enrolled margin of that opening right there. And these things, you know, oftentimes, especially late summer, they're still going off. They're the only thing producing nectar when everything else is done flowering. You can see it's already, you know, early July, you know, Mac Dre's birthday, Andre Hicks, you know, wonderful uh, Bay Area rapper, RIP, okay? It's already early July, and, uh, you know, most things are wrapping up. You still got the Lillian part of lineup up there, but by early August, all that shit's going to be done. Nothing's going to be flowering. These are going to be the only nectar source around, okay? For, for insects to go visit, of course. Remember, most of them don't actually end up in that picture. So the, the Darling Tony has almost got kind of a mutualistic relationship with the insects. They benefit off it, too. It's not just, uh, you know, digesting the nectar uh, that uh, from their decaying bodies, the 1% or 2% of insects that end up in that cage. Okay? So no one really knows why that fish tail structure is a couple different reasons. Again, evolution doesn't have a purpose. There's only adaptive traits, benefits, and maladaptive traits, which uh, maladaptive traits obviously lead to... Uh, the extinction and the eventual uh, snuffing out of whatever organisms have those maladaptive traits. Maybe that'll happen to our species. All right, the other last thing I want to bring up is that this plant does not actually secrete enzymes to digest those bugs at the base of that tube. It doesn't do the digesting itself. It utilizes bacteria to do it for it. It's another interesting thing that it's not actually, the plant's not actually digesting the bugs itself, secreting the enzymes, you know, like a fungus or something to help uh, break down whatever the, what, you know, the, the insect carcasses that end up at the base of it, the bacteria does it, and then uh, the bacteria and the plant both profit. So like everything you can see, it's all interconnected. There's a lot of shit going on, a lot more going on uh, beneath the surface, and we have only scratched the surface. Wonderful fucking plant, Darlingtonia californica, okay? You can find it now uh, in, a <laughs> find it now in Northern California in Southern Oregon. Can you imagine what it would be like if, uh, the herbalists went after this thing. Say they made up like a placebo effect that this was supposedly good for if you ground up the leaves. <laughs> Some hippie sleaze comes out here and it wants to play shaman, you know, or, or better yet, one of these survivalist guys that thinks, you know, they're going to survive the apocalypse by, uh, by foraging and, uh, you know, starts just ripping this shit out the ground. Just like, you know, rips out half the population to make potions and tinctures for placebo effects he just makes up. What would that be like? Thank God it hasn't happened. At least not yet. And I'm not, you know, I'm I, I'm not trying to knock herbalists too much. There are plenty of responsible people that are into herbal medicine. Plants are, of course, you know, chemical factories. Uh, you know, there's people that grow their own. If you're growing your own, you're not harming anything, okay? And there's plenty of people that don't come out and harvest rare plants, quote, harvest. But, I mean, when it really comes down to it, do you need it? I just, you know, you just take your fat ass for a run, eat healthy. Don't drink the excess, at least not if you're a... Trying to be healthy. If you don't give a shit and you're a nihilist and you want to drink Texas, go ahead and be my guest. But if you're trying to be healthy, just live a healthy lifestyle. You don't need to come out here and, you know, rip, rip all this shit out the ground and fuck with what little wild land is left in this bleak uh, time of uh, human impact on everything on planet Earth. You know? Mmm, yes. Oh, this is a wonderful tool to have in the medicine cabinet. Fantastic plant right here. Yes, this is good for stopping circular thoughts. It's good for recovery support. It's good for uh, mediating the nervous system. It's a nervous system ally. It's a nervine. 
okay? It's just just very grounding overall. And is, you especially want to harvest it on the full moon because that's when many of these properties uh, that I just illustrated for you are, are going to be present in this plant, okay? Just kidding. If you take this, your liver might shut down. If you were to ingest this internally, this is a Veritrum californicum. Uh, like many members of the Melanthiaceae, the monocot family in the order of lilies, this is a very toxic plant. And uh, there's another plant in that family Melanthiaceae called Death Camus, which is, again, the, uh, the common name says it all. You don't want to eat this. Colloquially, these are known as the corn lilies because I guess someone thought they looked like corn, which again is another monocot. It's got that parallel leaf venation and flower parts in multiples of uh, three. In this case, you can see you got the six peoples right there. Very beautiful flowers on this guy. I love this family. Okay, seen some really interesting ones uh, near the Nevada de Toluca down there in Mexico. It's uh, an active volcano. You can see those six peoples with those striations. Those striations on the inside, as well as that uh, beautiful uh, dark green color on the inside of that perianth right there. You got six stamens, yellow anthers, and uh, can almost see that uh, stigma, three-lobed uh, stigma. So anyway, there you go. Veritrum californicum, Melanthiaceae. Please don't eat this. Or do, you could, I mean, if you're trying to go out, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not going to stop you. Okay, so going up in elevation a little bit, we're still on the serpentine. This serpentine is kind of a red sheen to it, okay? It's probably, a, yeah, it's maybe what you would call dirty serpentine. There's a little bit of mudstone in there, too. Remember, these rocks do start out in the ocean, and then they get, uh, their oceanic crust, and they get slapped onto the edge of the continent by the subduction zone. But, of course... Being the open exposed habitat in the American West, we have a species of buckwheat, okay, Ariagonum, okay, in the Polygonaceae, the buckwheat family. This is Ariagonum compositum, also known as the arrow leaf buckwheat. You can see those yellow umbels, beautiful yellow umbels on top of those peduncles right there, those flowering stalks, okay. You can see what they call it, the arrow leaf buckwheat, because yeah, the leaf looks like an arrow. Imagine that. Flip that uh, leaf over. Oh, look at that. You get a nice rust on that, that abaxial side. Flip that leaf over. You see that abaxial side of the leaf. Got a nice uh, woolly indumentum. www.woollyindumentum.com. Just be all full of frontal, uh, you know, porn shots of uh, abaxial sides of leaves with all those hairs and shit. Oh, look at that. You got some, uh, appears to be a ladybug larvae uh, eating, uh, probably eating aphids. Anyway, there's the individual flowers with those uh, yellow anthers atop white stamens sticking out of each one of those tiny individual flowers that's only about, I don't know, four millimeters in diameter. God, I love the buckwheats. There's so fucking many of them, too. So many. And they do so well in the uh, Zeric West. The Zeric Mountainous West. You know, sheen on it. And it, uh... Piece of serpentinite. Look at this. The Ariagum compositum. Once they germinate, okay, these are these are young plants. Okay, probably only a year or two old. Look at the color of those leaves. Look at that. It just blends right in with the substrate right there. That's always impressive too. Phyto camouflage. Whole lot of nothing out there. Just what I like. So hard to find these days. And it's going to become increasingly harder to find as that time goes on. Okay, and here's another caryophyllaceous bastard. Just like that uh, Minowarthia is a species of uh, aeromagony. You can see it's got basal leaves. Kind of like needle-like basal leaves. Then it sends up these uh, inflorescences, these flowering stalks. Over here you got a nice penstemon. Penstemons are always... Uh, Always stunners to see the beard tongues. Except that this doesn't have a beard tongue. It's just got a staminode. See that rod poking out? A staminode with no uh, no wool on it, no fuzz. Opposite leaves, of course, waxy with that uh, kind of glaucous green color to them. Oh, look at that. Draping all over the rocks. Remember the uh, jade plant family? Crassulaceae. Here you got a species of sedum. Probably sedum uh, kirsteriae. Named after Julie Kirsten, a friend of mine 
the old uh, retired Forest Service botanist for Shasta County. I think that was her title. Maybe I'm fucking it up. I don't know. Wonderful woman. Oh, look at this. Another species of sedum right there. A lot of sedums in these uh, higher elevation uh, montane habitats. They're all pretty impressive. There's one in full flower. Oh, yeah. Echeveria, Graptopetalum, Kalenko, all members of this family. Okay? This is the family that the Crassulacean acid metabolism was named after. You know, whereby uh, plants from hot, dry environments take in their carbon dioxide at night and then uh, you store it to close their stomata during the day. And, uh, you know, use it during photosynthesis during the day when the sun's out with their stomata closed. Oh, yeah, look at this guy. Sedum lanceolatum, crassulaceate, a stone crop family. Okay? No chlorophyll, obvious. There's chlorophyll in there. There's green pigments in there beneath those anthocyanin pigments. Okay? But nothing obvious. Okay? And that red color, of course, uh, both helps it blend in with those uh, red metamorphics it's on, as well as... Uh, Reduces the damage of uh, some of those uh, ultraviolet uh, rays because uh, most of the sedums do like to grow in rather exposed environments. If you look at the flowers right there, five yellow petals, ten stamens, and uh, kind of a red, uh, you can see the petals, they have kind of red margins on them when they're peeling back. Before they peel back, pretty impressive little guy right there. Again, growing at the base of these, uh, these red metamorphics. Hey, you got some grays in there. Huh? You got, it's not, oh, you got some green up there. And maybe that's just the lichen. You go growing in a seep. You got a species of uh, potentilla. Okay? Rose family, rosaceae. You got uh, about, you know, two foot tall inflorescences. Got some carline leaves there. And then the basal leaves. Kind of look like strawberries, which again are in rosaceae. You know, it's, it's a thing you see a lot with the rose family. Is that uh, those uh, serrate leaf margins? See, just like a little uh, saw blade, saw blade leaf margins. Oh yeah, pretty fuzzy too. Pretty fuzzy leaves. You know, it took me a while to get into rosaceae because I've been so, you know, <laughs> I've been, I've been one to abhor roses. I just kind of hate them for so uh, so much of my life. You know, just hoard, the token horticultural atrocity. And just all the corny human symbolism, etc. But this family, Rosaceae, is really cool, all right? Okay, you got Circle Carpus Letifolius, one of the longest-lived uh, flowering plant species. It's a, it's, you know, tree. Tend to get it at higher elevations. There's some at the top of this uh, this mountain, actually. Way up there. Here's Circle Carpus right here, all right? Longest lived angiosperm. Okay, some of these can live upwards of 1,500 years. There's the uh, very distinct achenes. Those one seed of fruits with those little plumosa tails on them. Circocarpus letifolius. Okay, and this is a small one. They're known as mountain mahogany. They, they grow really slowly. But there's one at the top of it. Uh, well, you can't even fucking see it. It's about two 2,000 more feet up. But uh, there's one up at top. It's got to be upwards of 800 to 1,000 years old. I mean, it's a foot, foot and a half diameter growing at the uh, remains of a glacial lake. But, uh, you know, I got time to show you that today. So we're off the serpentine, but we are on some pretty interesting uh, metamorphics. A lot, of, a lot of nice metamorphic rock. Thoroughly cooked rock. Thoroughly cooked. Anyway, let's look at this, this species of penstemon over here. Higher elevation penstemon. We are at about 6,000 feet right now. Get up close, look at those flowers. Look at that. Look, they got the fuzzy lower lip, fuzzy anthers up top. Okay. Two fused petals up top, three fused petals on the bottom, just like most penstemons. All right, but this one forms a little mat, okay, with those uh, really odd leaf margins, okay? Kind of dentate with a red margin right there. And there you go. I got a flower dissected for you. 
that uh, one appendage on the uh, left right there and the uh, upper on the top you can see uh, that's the style got no anther on it the rest of the stamens okay each with the uh, fuzzy anthers then you got that uh, staminode which you can see it's got a little bit of fuzz on it it's you know shorter than all the rest and in the center of that flower okay this is a pretty common guy you see him up uh, he likes the rocky substrates higher elevation Beautiful bastard right there. You got your Arctostaphylos patula too. More of that uh, aeromogony right there. That carophyllaceous prick. He's not a prick. I'm just kidding. Just I just uh, you know easy to write off. The, I don't get too enthused about carophyllaceae. So that's that's tonight's view. Well, that's all I got for you tonight. Have a good rest of your evening. You know, if you're feeling bummed out or something or kind of anxious, why don't you just put on a spinners? Listen to a little bit of spinners. Can't go wrong with the spinners. Everybody loves the spinners. All right? All right, don't be a prick. Have a good rest of your evening. Uh, go fuck yourself. Bye.